How are you? I'm coming back to you with another live events change your lives. I'm telling you, when we were together in January in Birmingham, I was so pumped up. A hundred of our favorite friends finding ways to become financially free and get there faster. we got to do it again. Let's get together in the music city capital of the world, Nashville, Tennessee, August the 25th through the 27th. No doubt, Russ. Live events do change lives, just like Rick who left his job nine months earlier as a result of being at this event in Birmingham. The relationships are the accelerator. And I can't wait to hear your story when you join us. Go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash live. And don't forget to use promo code podcast to get 20% off your ticket. Go there right now. The word retirement is a buzzword. It's the thing that we all have been hearing since we started our jobs, that we're going to save and invest and one day retire, right? I remember going all the way back to when I was a certified financial planner. That's what I was taught. That's what I was trained is you can help people hopefully in 20, 30, 50 years in some situations retire. Well, today's episode, we're breaking down the retirement trap that comes from Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. This is part 13 of a series that Joey and I did over three years ago. And I don't care if you're just getting started or if you've been doing this for a long time, you're going to gain amazing nuggets. So get your pen, your pencil, your iPhone, your iPad, whatever it is, take some notes because we're going to break down three main points. One, what is retirement? And why is it the opposite? I mean, the opposite of what we really want. Second point is what is the math? and how the financial and tax advisors out there leave out some of the most important information out of their calculations. And third, what have others been doing to get out of, or more importantly, avoid this trap? Join me right now as we jump in to part 13 of Becoming Your Banker book series, The Retirement Trap. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome. This is the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Your host, Joey the Italian Stallion Mure, joined as always by Russ the Idea Guy Morgan. Russ, this is episode 13 of our review of Nelson Nash's famous book, Becoming Your Own Banker. This is where it all started. It's where we go back to for constant um, just imagination, if you will. Like, I feel like the more we've gone dived into this book again and again, we see things that were always there but now it means something different. Today is no different. We're talking about the retirement trap. This is page 66 and 67 in the book. And I love how Nelson starts this off, Russ, because he's calling somebody on the carpet, kind of tongue in cheek about history. You know, that's like one of his favorite things in the world. He, He loves going back. He says, you can't understand economics without history. And he would start a lot of times in seminars and talks that we were around with him as he would kind of bring us back to subject matter, whether it was a race riots in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and, and tying that to many things, right? Or he was telling us about the ludicrousy of how the federal government creates um, acts and laws. And if you look at them, you'll see 180 degrees. The, the opposite of what their intended goal was is what the result would be. That's right. And he says here, he wanted to, he wanted to put a point out there that, hey, in 1976 was this so-called bicentennial year, but Nelson said that's not when we became free, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, that's the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, but that wasn't necessarily when we became a country, right? Well, no, we didn't become a country until we had the Constitution of the United States, and that didn't happen until 1789. Ah, okay. So I can imagine, I didn't know Nelson then, but he was probably having his own bicentennial in 1989. Probably so, knowing Nelson, because <laughs> he loved to correctly classify. That's right. And he always wants to point out little things. And that's what this chapter is about, Joey, the retirement trap. A couple key words here. Retirement. Retirement is to take out a service. 
are, are we called to serve? Hundred percent. So when when it uh, when the, the concept of retirement didn't even exist until when? Well, not until the 1890s. Here, that's what that's what he talk, points about in in Germany. Yeah, the the idea of retirement when when 19, uh, 1900 years before we ever had the first word of it, and that didn't happen until we got into the socialist movement of Bismarck in Germany, who was trying to think of. The fact that he can never imagine what entrepreneurs like us and you that are listening to this have been able to figure out how to create more jobs. That's he right. Just assume we got to get the old people out of workforce. Yeah, it's like a scarcity that, oh, there's not enough jobs. So we got to get rid of the, the people at the top end. The other part of this chapter title is trap. When you think trap, what do you think about? I think of like a mouse trap, something like that. Uh, I think like the trap of the predator. Man, take you back to the little Arnold Schwarzenegger days. Man. Mm. You remember when he's trying to set the trap for that ugly character and he, he's trying to lure him into that one area? Yeah. But in this situation, we are the bait. No doubt. Because when we start looking through this chapter, he says there is trillions of dollars that the government has set out there as bait and we have fallen for. It. Hook, line, and sinker. All right, so let's get into this chapter. Let's talk about what does all of this have to do with us and how can we avoid this trap and be able to prosper, right? Because yes, maybe we want to be financially free. And yes, that means for you, maybe spending more time with your family. Maybe that means volunteering. Maybe that means travel. Maybe that means creating a new business. But what we're all about is not sitting around on a couch doing nothing because we know that that cannot last. We are here to create value, use our passions, our skills, put those to work, and money follows value. So when you hear us talking about retirement in a negative content, uh, content don't think of don't think of the value. Wait a second, I thought that was my objective. I thought I was my goal was to stop trading time for money, and the answer is yes. Stop trading time for money for something that you hate. But Joey, I love what you and I do absolutely I can't every day. Ever see us? not doing what we do. But here's the thing. Do we do a lot more than just sit on this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We, in fact, we were just trying to work out a real estate deal before we walked in here. Like, oh, we got to get our podcast done. We got to get the podcast done. We really want to think about this investment over here. Yeah, we're, we're constantly doing something else. It, there in lies the things that we're called to do. So please, as we dive into this, I want you to think about what is it that your purpose is and help yourself avoid this construct that was created barely over a hundred years ago by a socialist who was trying to figure out ways to get the old people out of the workforce because he could never envision you and me creating businesses that created jobs and created an abundance. All right, so Joey, he really starts this chapter off hammering social security as he should, by the way. No doubt. Yeah. He, he gives us this quote. And then this is what he wrote bent down in 1976. By the way, if you're not following along with us in your own book, I want you to make sure and go buy the book right now. Go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash IBC book. Go get it. That way you can follow along with us. Okay, that was a sidebar. But he starts off his quote here. This is page 66 at the very top. He says, Social Security will fall as have all socialist programs since time began. Before it falls, they will attempt to prop it up. The source of funds that they will use is reserves of private pension plans and other government sanctioned schemes. Why is that important to you, Russ? I think of right now, you think of um, how we've been collecting money from people and paying out Social Security benefits for a long period of time. We're, we're really close right now to where the Social Security, the intake, the money coming in that they're allocating towards Social Security reserves are going to be less than what they're paying out. Mm. And, and by the way, this isn't... That sounds backwards, This by isn't way. something that's really that new considering that the first person, Miss Ida Fuller, 1940, Joey, received a $24.75 check. No, that's what she put into it. Oh, no, you're, you're right. She she paid in $24.75. Man, look at you. Whew. Come on, he's sharp. Memory. Her first <laughs> check, though, she, she put that in from 1937 to 1939. Her first check she received was $22.54. She, she got them with all of it back <laughs> in the first payment. That's that's a good return, I'd say. All right, so we understand when if if you're of Social Security age and you're receiving a check and you you say, "Man, I'm just getting back what I paid in." That is a lie. 
just like Miss Ida Fuller, she's not getting back after that first check. She's not getting back what she paid in. She's getting someone else's money. Same way it is with you. Nelson would say this is a Ponzi scheme. This is an approach. It, it is nothing more than a tax. It is not some sort of savings account. And Nelson says this thing will fail. He knew it was going to fail, and he was writing these words down in 1976. He said, it's going to fail, and the only way that they're going to be able to bail this thing out is from the reserves on pension plans, which are now what we would consider 401ks and IRAs. Why did he use pension plans in 1976? What do you mean? Why did he use that word instead of 401ks and IRAs? Because they weren't around yet. They weren't around yet. When were they created? They weren't until 1978 is when the Revenue Act came around. That was uh, actually the, yeah, 1978. The Revenue Act 1978 is when IRAs were created. And then in 1981, they started allowing payroll deductions for 401ks. Yeah, so when, when he started talking about pensions, that was the type of qualified plan that existed at that time. Later, as we know it, those evolved into 401ks and IRAs. We'll talk a little bit about those, but he was... He was using what existed at the time. Well, we know a couple of things, Joey, right? Because I want to stop here because a lot of times people look at their retirement as what they've been putting in 401ks and IRAs. And they say, man, look at the history of the stock market. The stock market has been going up at 10 to 12% per Dave Ramsey, right? Yeah. Since the beginning <laughs> of time. Right. Uh, I think that was incorrect. Okay. Well, give me some history here. Okay. So, just kind of doing some quick uh, history. We looked at the market and in, up to 1980, right up to 1980, the market returns were right at 8.87%. Hmm. But guess what happened in the 80s when all these 401ks and IRAs were created and now there's payroll deduction and now there's this huge market of people flooding the market. Guess what? In the 1980s, the market went up 17.4%. Do you think that's any correlation? Yeah, absolutely. The government has been influencing the market for the last 40 to 50 years. It is something we constantly see. We see it now as the, the federal government. Every time they we, we have what they call quantitative easing, right? That's right. When they're flooding the market with money, we see the market jump. Anytime they stop that easing, we see the market bounce down. This continues to happen and has happened all the way back, going back to 1980, when the government allowed for payroll deductions for 401 ks because the average consumer was not buying stocks. That was not something that was uh, relevant. They, they were using actually life insurance policies up until that point, then started using pension plans. And then in the 1980s, they got access to something they never could and could have it payroll deducted. Shocking, when the demand rose, what happened to the price of the market? Going up. It went up. It wasn't anything more than the fact that you had a lot of people rushing to it, which created price increase. Well, we used, though, that 17.4%, which then took our, average, our, uh, our annualized return from 8% to almost 10%, right? That's right. Which skews people's opinion as to what happened, right? So we start looking at that, that little small time frame, which is indicative of what the government has done to it. No different than what we've seen over the last 10 years. Government's kept interest rates at zero, have flooded the market since 2008 in the, in the crash, and we've seen the market continue to rise. We're sitting here right now in the COVID-19. We're seeing 30% of people uh, that are unemployed. We're, we're seeing people um, rioting in the streets. You know, businesses closing down. But right. yet, yet the market somehow is going up. Yeah, I, I'm just going to throw out a couple names here. Neiman Marcus, Tuesday Morning, J.C. Penney, J. Crew, Gold's Gym, all bankrupt. And there's more to the list. This is just like what Russ and I could come up with in like two minutes. And the, and the market continues to go up? Yeah. The fundamentals are, are out the window. So when we're talking about the the retirement trap, where people are putting their money. Nelson wanted to point out a couple of things. Social Security, I'm going back there. I'm going to say, hey, look, the money that you're receiving or your parents are receiving or your grandparents are receiving is not their money. It's your money. It's whoever is currently working and putting money into the system. He says, well, where is that money going to have to come from when you're, the money you're putting in isn't large enough to pay for it? And that's about to happen. That's where, right. Where are they going to get it? He said, back in 1976, he's 
he he went on record to say it's going to come from when they go back and steal the money that people have been putting in these retirement plans. Now, Russ, it's not really stealing, though, is it? Well, technically, it's not stealing. <laughs> but someone who has a 401k or IRA sitting there with $100,000 or a million dollars in their account, if the government said, hey, wait a second, you know, last year when you put $10,000 in there, that really wasn't your money. 5000 of that was your money. 5000 is the money you should have paid me for taxes. I just granted you the exception to put it in at that point. So, yeah, you got 100000 in there. I need my fifty back. I need it right now. Okay, I'm going to point something out real quick. That's the cheese on the mousetrap. Deferring tax. That's what you just pointed out, right? The five, you put in 10, but really five of it was ours the whole time. But we've been told that deferring those taxes is like, that's a good thing, right? Like just the other day, we were talking to somebody on a podcast and they said, man, let me just tell you this deferred sales trust. This is the greatest thing since cut cheese or sliced bread, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and Please don't like, be cutting the cheese in here. <laughs> well, but what the, he, Get, I, tell them the example. Well, example. Well, I've heard, I've heard even CPAs say the same thing he said, which, so probably where he heard it from was a <laughs> CPA who said, man, think about how you get to compound interest on that money while it's being uh, tax deferred. As if, because my money is growing tax deferred, even though I'm going to have to pay tax on it in the future, I'm winning by the deferral. So let me give you an example. And, and this is just hypothetical, right? I'm not giving you one of <laughs> Joey's perfect uh, investments that he has that he never lets me in on. But <laughs> let's say you have a $100,000 investment and you have a chance to defer the tax and double your money over the time, right? So <laughs> your 100000 becomes 200000 But yet, for, for simplicity, I'm going to use a 50% tax bracket, right? Because nobody's going to get confused on the month, <laughs> on the math here. So 100000 grows to 200000 Joey. That's right. I'm with you. And I have to pay tax at the end of it on 50%. And this works at 10%, but it, I'm just going to keep the math simple. 50%, Joey, how much money am I left over with? 100000 100000 Okay. Or option B, I have to pay tax at my 50% tax rate today. So my 100000 I have to pay tax on how much money I got. You got 50000 50. Now, if I could put it into an account that could grow without taxes, and I could get it out without taxes. You know anything like that? I'll let you know if it comes up, <laughs> comes to mind. <laughs> we, we, we might have a couple of things, right? I know somebody like that. All right. If it grows, it doubles over that same time frame. 50 becomes what? 100,000. 100. If I had to pay taxes on it, and, if, and option A, I had 100,000. And option B, I end up with 100,000. Tell me exactly how I won by compounding interest on the, the government's money. You, you didn't. I didn't. It is, this is a, a, something that most people miss. When I hear people talking about tax deferred strategies and I sit down with them, I go, help me understand how I'm going to win. How could I win in that example, Joey? The only way you win is if you're in a lower tax bracket in the future. Can you envision a situation where the government's going to need less money in the future? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, Russ, one, like soon, they're going to wise up they're going to start paying their bills on time and they're not going to um, unbalance the budget. Like they're going to be on budget and everything's going to be fine. They're going to start paying that down and they're not going to need any more money from you in the future. Well, maybe you should be hearing sarcasm yeah, right now. Maybe that will happen, Joey, but here's a more likely circumstance. Would you like to know how much money is sitting in qualified plans right now? Yes. It's $32.3 trillion right now, right now. By the way, how, how do you think that I could figure out that math that quick? Do you think I had to go do lots of research? I think it was probably Google. <laughs> it was right there. <laughs> that, that, at the top of Google, I could figure out how much it was. I could go to the Investment Company Institute and get that data. Now, if Russ Morgan on the Wealth Wild Wall Street show can find out how much money that is, do you think um, Uncle Sam knows how much money is in these plans? I think he knows even more specifically than you do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so when they say, look, we got $24, $25 trillion in debt, national debt right now. If we really want to fix this, let's just go get our 50%. Well, and that's what, that's what Nelson says here at the bottom of the page. He said, they will always use the path of least resistance. They created the scheme and they can and will change their minds. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept 
to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the Passive Income Operating System, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before. Go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day. Why? Because you were unprepared. Are you unprepared, though, for financial freedom? Don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30-second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. I'm going to bring something really, really practical here. How many times have you been talking to somebody about infinite banking and and using whole life as a place to store capital? um, And they say, well, what if the government starts taxing whole life insurance? Yeah. I mean, how... Here's what I would say. I would look at page 66 and say, if they really need money, do you think they're going to go to the whole life insurance bucket that is contractual law that they have to go back in and change? Or are they going to go to the IRS and say, hey, by the way, that 32 trillion that's sitting over there, we're going to need some of that. Yeah, it's with a stroke of a pen. Well, by the way, it's theirs. They know exactly what percentage of that money is theirs. It's like, Joey, if I loaned you 20 bucks and just because it's in your it's in your wallet and you got forty dollars, you don't really have forty dollars. You got 20 years, you got 20 of mine. That's so, right. So if I come up and say, hey, I need that 20 now, I take it, get your wallet, I pull it out, that's my $20. That's not yours. So when you look at this 32 trillion, they know. By the way, I'm gonna make another point here. So and, and I don't mean to be like difficult here, but some of you have come to us and said, well, Joey, Russ, I've got a self-directed IRA. So I'm, I'm, I'm better off. I'm buying real estate now. I'm, I'm doing this short-term rental business. I'm doing lending out of my IRA. So I don't have the same concerns. Well, what they're saying is that I'm not dumb enough to invest in mutual funds, which, man, I applaud you on that. Right. You've, you've at least... Um, solve for the factor of volatility, right? I no longer have to worry about the market, you know, going haywire on me. I'm, I know what I'm investing in, but what's the fatal flaw? The fatal flaw is I'm compounding money in an account that I'm a partial owner. In. Okay. But to make it even a little bit clearer, you, you told me this, you, I'm going to give you credit here. Okay. What? You, told, you told me this and I thought, wow, this is a brilliant way to think about this. If I have $100,000 in my self-directed IRA and I have subsequently bought real estate with that, and it may be, let's just say that that equated to, you know, three homes, down payments for those and so on and so forth. Now, you asked the question, you said, who are you building a rental portfolio for? Is it for you or for somebody else? And when we put it in the wrapper of this self-directed IRA, all I'm doing is I'm putting my rental portfolio that I'm working hard to create. I'm sourcing the property. I'm rehabbing the property in some cases. I'm now managing the property, renting it out, so on and so forth. And someone else is a silent partner. They're going to tell me at some point in the future, how many of those homes were theirs and how many of them are mine. Well, and by the way, so is, you, is that shocking? If you don't follow what Joey's saying, just let's just use his example: a hundred thousand dollars that I had, and and I decided I didn't want to pay tax on, it. and so I went out and I bought three homes that I put thirty three thousand dollars down. Right? You following me? Yeah. And and I got three homes where if I would have had to pay thirty three percent in taxes on that money, I could have only bought two homes. Right. Not right. three. Right. So I go, man, I'm gonna buy three homes. With three homes, I got three homes worth of growth. I got three homes worth of rental income. But what ends up happening is I, I grow this three homes to nine homes, right? And it's, it's, it's going my way. And then we get to the end of the game. And I got nine homes and the government says, okay, we need our third. So really, you only had six and I had three. But the whole time, how many homes did you have to manage, Joey? All nine of them. How many homes did you have to deal with the tenants on? All nine of them. How, how many homes did you have to deal with the problems, the toilets, and all the renovations on? All of them. So you took all the work and all the risk, but yet I get a third of the result. Mm. 
that's that hurts. a beautiful thing, right? If you're an investor, but when you look at it on the other end, you say, wait a second, if I'm the one holding the weight of this thing, that doesn't make sense. And you don't have to do it that way. Literally go ahead and get out of that thing. If you go to, if you want to know about how one of our clients, Mark Haraguchi actually got out of this trap, he decided I'm going to take advantage of the CARES Act. I'm going to take advantage of what the government has told me. He went and sought legal counsel from tax attorneys and CPAs that told him exactly how to do it. He took money out of his 401k, both in the form of a withdrawal and a loan, and got out of the rat race so that he then could start accumulating money without taxes that he would not have to pay taxes on in the future. And he didn't have to do all the work for somebody else so that they get the benefit. Right? That's right. Now, what you're talking about, Russ, is in our inner circle. So if you are new to the show or you're just hearing this, you need to be a part of our IBC inner circle. You can go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash inner circle to join today. And you'll be able to have access to those Q&As, the hot seat guests, the, the constant information that we're sharing in this, um, the this community. So. Which we actually manage these policies and actually access to the coaches, which is what is vital, important, so that you don't make the same mistakes. Now, I, I need to make a real quick point here, Russ. Okay, I know. I you never cut, make a quick point. I keep point, cutting you off. Make a point. But I, I don't want to miss this one line that I think the whole thing predicates on here that Nelson says that this is doomed to failure. All these things we're talking about were doomed to failure because they start from an operation of the faulty premise that government knows how to order the lives of people better than the people themselves. Now, we talk about on the show, the Wall Street mindset. So just going back to the IRAs, the 401ks of the world, what we are trying to get people to see is that you and only you care about your money more than anybody else. Right. If to, to think that someone else is a money babysitter that's taking care of your 401k or IRA better than you would is a lie. It makes me think of the time when we had our, our, our first daughter and we had a little baby, our second one, and my wife comes home. We have a babysitter there. My wife comes home. The babysitter is dead asleep on the couch. The, our, our, our new baby is crying, screaming his head off. And our uh, two-year-old is running around in a diaper. That's it. Around the kitchen, just nonstop. And my wife is like, what in the H-E-L-L has <laughs> happened here? And this lady's asleep. Well, I mean, think about it, right? I mean, who's going to care for your own better than you do? For, so when we read that, I think I'm like, there's no way they care about it more than me. That's right. And the same goes true with government. So the socialist programs he's talking about here, the pension plans and IRAs and 401ks, he says the most dangerous thing you can do with money is put it into government sponsored schemes. <laughs> he said when a government creates a problem, onerous taxation, and then turns around and creates an exception to the problem they created. Any tax sheltered qualified plans, do you think, in just a little bit that you that you become suspicious that you're being manipulated? Hundred and fifty percent. So these are the things that we want to point out. So we're gonna move into the next part here. He starts talking about retirement. Okay. Why we've already mentioned it up front, but it's not biblical. Retirement would be taking us out of service, which by the way, we do retire. We either retire to heaven or to hell. <laughs> in this case, as believers, we're retiring to heaven that because we are no longer to serve. And when we stop serving, when we have no more breath. Well, I, I think about Nelson. I mean, he died last March and he was doing conferences. He was teaching. He was teaching people economics in the hospital bed the <laughs> night before he, he graduated. And he, he would always... Con you know, point out people, point out people in this book where he talked about John Templeton, who at age 80, re, quote unquote, retired from running his fund and started doing charitable causes and said he was working harder than ever. I look back and I find famous football coaches like Joe Paterno or Bear Bryant, those people who died really quickly after they quit working. Charles Schultz, the Peanuts cartoon yeah. artist, Andy Rooney, the uh, 60 Minutes guy. I, mean, I even read some studies going into the Shell Oil companies where they actually found that more people who retired at 55 were dying at a faster rate than those 
who uh, retired at 65. I mean, even I then, uh, Joey, did a little more research and I found that people in Greece said that 51% of them were, had, um, were, were dying at a faster rate than those who were still working. Mm. That tells you something. That this is not a man-made, retirement is a man-made thing. And again, I think it comes from a scarcity mindset. It comes from this like, you know, um, sustainability idea, which be honest with you, it started in Germany. And I started thinking about it. Man, what kind of ideas were predicated on Nazi Germany? It's about sustainability. It's about having enough um, resources for this master race and get rid of all these cockroaches, right? This is, this is a bad idea. It's a, it's a sinful idea. And we have to be the ones to say, no, we're not going to fall for that. And he goes into the next thing here, I think, super important. Well, I think it's living from an abundant mindset, right? There is enough for everyone. Right. I, I know that this is taboo, right? You just brought up the kind of the racist acts of the Nazis. We've got situations happening in our country today, but I come from the opinion where the Bible says there's only one race. Yeah. Right. So when we think about like that, we, if we take this abundant approach that God made us all equal, right. Then, then we, we don't have to worry about the sustainability. We don't live in a world of scarcity. There's enough for everyone, and those who want to create value do create value and are rewarded for it. 100%, which brings us into the next part, and I think you just brought up current day events. So I'm going to tell you, man, when Russ and I were reading through this next part, this is the top of page 67, he starts uncovering how the government during World War II started having stickers on your car, A, B, and C, for when you could get gas. And I thought, hmm, I don't, I don't, I wasn't there. You know, I wasn't present then. So let me look this up. We started Googling pictures of these stickers and I thought, man, rationing gas. Then he talks about how um, the women at the time could go to buy groceries, but there was ration points. I thought, wait a minute, this all sounds really familiar. We just coming out of this COVID-19 where we go to the grocery store and there's how, there's limits to how much eggs we can buy, right? Limits to how much meat we can buy. We think about is limits to what companies can be open and what businesses can be essential and what other ones can't. Does that sound like rationing to you? It, it's government playing <laughs> control, right? It, it's them saying that they know what's better. I mean, here's an example. My brother-in-law and sister-in-law have 11 kids. 11 kids. That's a lot of kids, guys. No that, doubt. That is a football team. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and my four love playing with them. They're a lot of fun. But when my brother-in-law goes to the grocery store during COVID-19 and he, go get, he goes to get ground beef, and it says you can only get two one-pound packets of ground beef, that ain't even a good appetizer. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't even fit the bill, right? How is that, it, you know, is that not a form of rationing for someone who is demon who can get what and who can't? Hundred percent, yeah. That that's exactly what we're living through right now, and that's the thing that I, again I want to point this out that Nelson says that we should avoid all of these such programs like the plague. Anything that's socialist, this, he said, this is a socialist paradise. All the rationing and stuff like that you were just talking about, and then he goes into this next piece. Well, hold, hold on, really quickly, because I I think this is important, and and it's important to have facts, Joey. When when Nelson actually in this chapter, though, he's identifying a book that was written in 1950 by, I'm going to brutalize his name, <laughs> Paul Perot of the Foundation for Economic Education. The book was called The Pension Idea. Now, I have not read it in full, but I've read a couple little pieces there. So give me just a little snippet, right? Tell me, tell me one idea that you captured from that, because I think it's important to the subject matter that we're dealing with. Yeah, so I think the the baseline just very at the very beginning again when I read this, he said that we're talking about um, sharing and these things of pension and the government being charitable. And he says it's impossible 
for the government to be charitable because they don't produce anything. You can't give away something that you didn't produce. In fact, they said in this case, the giver is forced to contribute with no opportunity to appraise the needs of the receiver or to judge the goodness of the deed. Charity is not a product of coercion. There is no such thing as charity unless it be granted voluntarily. So, so here, let's just go current events, right? Yes. I, I can think of two examples right now that we're dealing with in June 2020. We're preparing for an election year. You got one group, uh, one party out there who's saying, look at this other party who is not wanting to be charitable. They are not wanting to help you. We are trying to give you money. We've seen stimulus act after stimulus act from the government. In the trillions. In, in the, the trillions. trillions of yeah. dollars. It's like four or five trillion dollars they've printed out and given out in stimulus check. Is that charity, Joey? Absolutely not. Why is it not charity? Because it was taken by force <laughs> from us to begin with. When they take something from someone else, tax dollars, and from that force, because if you don't give it to them, what will they do? They will uh, take your property. They'll take your property. If you, if you don't have any property, what will they do? They'll throw you in jail. They'll throw you in jail. So that's as big a force as you can. That's coercion. Do you think the person who comes to pick you up in jail has a gun? Absolutely. So that's it, like them holding a gun to your head and forcing you to give them money. Yeah, that is not charity. It's no more charity than anybody who's looting right now, breaking into stores and turns around and gives one of those TV TVs to their mom. Is that charity? No, because the person in which they got it from did not freely give it to them. Absolutely not. And, and I think that this, this is a very important part for us to understand that all of these government sponsored programs are dealing from the IRS code taxation. And we've got to find a way to revolt from that, to become independent. Independence is when we don't have to worry about what the government's doing. I believe a lot of the oppression that we're seeing has been created by the government. I would 100% agree with you. And I would say that is what the infinite banking concept is always all about. It's about secession from a system that is being manipulated. It's about 100%. free contracts with free people. I mean, this is something that I, I'm fired up right now. If you hadn't already <laughs> tell this, right? I mean, there's a lot going on in our country right now. A lot of people are at unrest and there's a lot of uh, bad and good happening. What's ha you know going on right now. And I just think of how many people have become enslaved to our government because of their policies and procedures. And now we are trying to help people. And Nelson spits it out so clearly. He wants people to understand that what, what we're talking about is creating free contracts with free people. And we succeed from the system. We don't have to depend on them. We have independence. That's what financial freedom really looks like is when you are not dependent on someone else's capital. You need to take over the banking function in your life and you need to do it, like you said, through free contracts with free people. I don't know if we can continue on because Russ's blood pressure is going through the roof right now. We're going to have to go get him checked out. Thank you for joining us again for another episode, and we'll see you on the next one. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.